sorts of models and simulations of scientific evidence, calls for sound science, as some Republican members of Congress put it, uh, disputes about the um, contribution of anthropogenic uh, causes, attempts to cast doubt on the integrity um, uh, of forecasts and also of experts. Um, so um, I think uh, um, what we would like to uh, discuss today and also in, in following meetings are, you know, what are the sources of skepticism about climate change and all mi mistrust in climate science? What uh, processes, mechanisms, and dynamics are implicated in provoking and prolonging the debate? To what extent are these specific to climate science? Um, and to what extent they're representative of a broader mistrust in experts? What can be done to increase trust or more effectively build consensus around appropriate responses to the climate crisis? Uh, these are hopefully some of the themes that our panelists today will address. Before I introduce the panelists, uh, let me just give a quick shout out that we will have a second event uh, addressing similar themes on May 17th at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, with Naomi Oreskes from Harvard, Mike Holm from uh, Cambridge, and our very own Andy Revkin from our very own climate school. Um, you will all get invitations uh, for this event in the next couple of weeks. Um, we have an equally distinguished panel today. Let me introduce them in the order that they will speak. Our first speaker will be Paul Edwards. He is the William J. Perry Fellow of the, of Inter in International Security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. He's also a professor of information and history at the University of Michigan. He's the author of A Vast Machine, Computer Models, Climate Data, and the Politics of Global Warming a book that when it came out in 2010, has not only set the standard, I would say, for research on the history of climate science, but also inaugurated a whole new genre of research on data infrastructures. And fittingly, Paul is also the co-editor of a very influential infrastructure book series at MIT Press. Take a look at their titles, they're quite extraordinary. Um, Recently, he's also contributed to an edited volume on data politics, a chapter that is relevant to today's theme titled Knowledge Infrastructures Under Siege, Climate Data's uh, Memory, Truth, and Target. A second speaker uh, will be Mayanna Lassen. Uh, she's a senior associate uh, researcher, so that's the highest federal rank um, in the Earth System Science Center of the Brazilian Institute of Space Research. Um, Shortly, perhaps, she, uh, she, she's speaking to us today from the Netherlands. Shortly, perhaps, she will take a position at Linköping uh, University in Sweden. So truly um, a, global, um, a global scholar. She's also uh, worked here in the United States and, and in um, the Netherlands. Uh, she's a cultural anthropologist and a science studies uh, scholar who for years has been a close observer of climate science as well as a participant and leader uh, of an important effort to integrate social science into sustainability research, especially in the framework of uh, Future Earth and the IPCC. Uh, some of her seminal articles include, uh, and I teach them in my courses, include um, from 2013, Anatomy of Descent, a Cultural Analysis of Climate Skepticism, and more recently, How Norms, Needs, and Power in Science Obstruct Transformations Towards Sustainability. Our final speaker will be uh, Peter Weinger. Um, he is research fellow at, his, at the Center for Research on Evaluation, Science and Technology at Stellenbosch University in uh, South Africa, uh, where previously he held the South African Research Chair in Science Communication. He's also Professor Emeritus at the Department of Sociology in Bielefeld University, formerly there the Director of the Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Research currently the editor-in-chief of Minerva. is the author of multiple books about expertise, science advice, and science communication. I personally have found his work and his analysis of the interrelationships between science, politics, and the media extraordinarily <laughs> insightful and inspiring. Um, final uh, note before we start, um, after the speakers are done, the floor will be open to Q&A, uh, but we've reserved the right of first question to two of the graduate fellows working with the seminar, uh, Musa Al-Garbi and Aaron Plasek. 
Uh, something tells me you'll hear these names plenty in the future. Um, Musa is a, a PhD uh, candidate in the Department of Sociology. He's also an influential public intellectual. His essays in political analysis and social criticism have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Nation, etc. Aaron is a PhD candidate in the Department of History, where he's writing a dissertation about the history of computation and artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning. He has worked at the Artificial Intelligence Now Symposium, and he's also a well, a well published poet. Um, the audience will have, um, uh, will see a Q&A feature. Can see, you can see a Q&A feature on your Zoom dashboard. You can type in your question at any time during the presentations. Um, please indicate to whom the question is directed. Um, you can see all the other people's questions and you can vote which questions you want the panelists to address. Um, when the Q&A begins, I will read the questions to the panelists in the order they have been upvoted. Um, and I'll repeat those instructions later. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, we can uh, turn to Paul Edwards. Um, please, Paul. Gil, thank you so much. And uh, it's really great to be at this seminar. This is not the first Sawyer seminar I've been part of, and I, I found all of them really terrific. Let's see, I don't have a lot of time and I want to cover a lot. So let me just get going. We're going to talk today about trust and truce and truth. And why are we talking about those things? A little bit of background. I'm going to use this phrase knowledge infrastructures that uh, I and my colleagues in different places have been using for a while now. That refers to robust networks of people, equipment and institutions that generate, share, and maintain specific knowledge about the human and natural worlds. The whole idea of an infrastructure is something routine, reliable, and widely accepted. So what are examples of this? Well, bureaus of labor statistics and the World Weather Watch, World Weather Forecasting, those are relatively uncontroversial, but of course, others such as the Centers for Disease Control, the national census bureaus and the IPCC have become more controversial in recent years. And that's part of what we're talking about now. So the title of this talk and the article that was distributed come from a, 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 a well-known book in the 1980s on uh, economic sociology. They looked at routines in organizations and their purpose then was to try to understand how it is that large organizations hang together and continue to function even as people within them move in and out of the organization. So one point of that uh, book was that routines in organizations are the way that organizational knowledge is maintained over time. Sometimes these can be converted into technological systems. Their concept was that routines work even when people break rules, even when people are lazy, even when they defy the rules, and that that happens because there is a kind of organizational truce. They were thinking about relationships between labor and management, but this can also be applied more widely. The notion of target in their work was the idea that routines invented in an organization become norms or goals and also patterns for building new routines as the organization grows and changes over time. So I'm going to take those terms and use them in a somewhat different way. Applying to climate knowledge systems, we have memory, which is a way of holding and stabilizing information about the history of climate over time. I'll get back to that in a second. Truce here means that knowledge systems continue to function and be useful to us, even when they are partially controversial, even when there is uncertainty, even when people challenge the uh, results that come out of them. Because, for example, with weather forecasting, we need the weather forecast. So paying close attention to the details of how the weather forecast is made becomes less important than maintaining a sense that this is a legitimate kind of knowledge 
that is usable and useful in everyday life. In the Nelson and Winter sense, knowledge institutions like weather forecasting create norms and goals and use older systems as models for newer ones. And I could develop that more, but instead I'm going to turn to the main point for today, which is a different sense of target. The idea that knowledge systems for climate are targets now of disinformation, misinformation, and challenges that are not strictly about science per se, but more on the level of individuals. Okay, so briefly, we have memory. I'll talk about climate data. We'll have the truce, which is the way that these knowledge institutions are now managed in a situation of maximum transparency. And finally, the siege on these knowledge institutions that's made them a target. Memory. I could speak for a long time about this because this has been the main focus of my work for a long time, the, the history of climate data systems and how the, our knowledge has evolved. So one point here is that we, we need a memory of planetary history. Uh, ice cores are spoken about in climate science as a kind of archive. They contain samples of air from millions of years ago. More recent records, these, you know, what you see here is a graph of changing uh, instruments, the, in this case, uh, precipitation gauges in different countries at different times when they add or change instruments. So you see on this slide, a wind shield is added to Swedish precipitation gauges, and you get a stepwise change in the amount of precipitation recorded. That's not an error, it's just a different characteristic of a different instrument. And the previous gauges must now be adjusted to account for this difference. So the data record, not the gauges themselves, but the record of their data has to be adjusted to account for that difference. This is easy to do when you know the characteristics of the different instruments, but it is not an obvious thing to people who are uh, not trained in this field. So we have frequent changes in the uh, memory of the past. So what you see at the top are corrections to the existing uh, world climate data record. Uh, from older corrections to newer corrections. And then down at the bottom, you see how much this changed the data record. The lower line is the data without corrections. The upper line is the data with corrections. The corrections are, are essential. They can't, the, 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 the record is meaningless without them because they don't, it, it's taking older instruments and trying to match them to newer ones. So what's happened over the last 30 plus years is a great advance in our understanding of climate. And just briefly here, you know, we have gone from the first IPCC assessment that where uh, the signal of climate change had not emerged from the noise, energy budget was open, the sea level budget was open, in 2021, as the IPCC sixth assessment comes out, those are both budgets are closed, so the inputs and outputs are uh, have been connected. And down here at the lower level, we see all these ways that we know things about the climate, uh, from numbers of weather stations used in the historical data record, which now go back goes back to about 1750. Uh, records of temperature go back now 65 million years as opposed to 5 million years just uh, you know, 30 years ago, and 450 million year record of carbon dioxide. Global ocean heat content, one of the most important variables now known globally for about 1871 to 2018, and satellite remote sensing since 1990 in all kinds of different areas. So there, there's been a great deal of growth in the evidence base for climate change. There's also been growth in understanding of uh, the, the potential for climate change. And th this slide simply points you to the scientific consensus that has existed uh, since 
the, uh, the since 1979 on the approximate uh, change when we double carbon dioxide from pre-industrial levels. Key thing here is that the 2021 report, which is not out yet, but will be soon, uh, uses a, a World Climate Research Program result that, says, that cuts the, the uncertainty on that sensitivity in half to 2.5 to 4 degrees. Okay. I'm running shorter on time than I expected, so I want to focus on this because this is really the heart of what I want to say. I discovered in doing some etymology that the words truce and truth are in fact the same word in the English language. In Middle English, this was true. The plural was truce, and they refer in both cases to fidelity to a promise, to an engagement, to a covenant, in the sense of being true to a person, true to your word. And that older meaning was the principal meaning of the word true until rather recently. And it was deeply connected to loyalty to a person. So to, to showing support for a leader, for a country, for a cause. And I hope the resonance of that is clear into the modern context. The secondary meaning, the secondary meaning that we use so often today in accordance with factor reality comes in much later. So what's the relationship between true and truce? In science, the, that relationship has to do with routines, with the ability of science to present its methods publicly, to have other experts review those methods. And we have moved from a world in which that happened in a relatively restricted context among experts to one in which that glass laboratory is out there in the middle of a giant city and everyone is watching. So we now publish data, we publish models, we publish even emails of uh, climate scientists, and all of those things are investigated and used in so-called audits of climate science. So let me turn quickly to the target and close this out. Uh, as you certainly know, there have been long campaigns for, uh, by the fossil fuel industry to disinform the public to create uh, uh, ways of thinking about climate science that question its methods and its results. This happened you know, in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, fossil fuel companies had their own climate scientists who told them exactly what climate scientists still say, that this is a dangerous product that is going to uh, cook the world in its own juices. But uh, as it became clear that that was going to be a problem, they fired those scientists, they covered up the results that they had uh, paid for, and uh, went to a, a, a doubt-provoking mode, well covered by Naomi Oreskes and, her, and Eric Conway in Merchants of Doubt. Much more recently, uh, in the Trump administration in the United States, we saw all kinds of efforts to do this same sort of thing, to disinform people by literally removing uh, sections from websites of the Global Climate Research Program and the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy and others, just removing references to climate change, pushing them down to lower levels of their uh, websites and other ways of just removing the information. There's also been the longstanding effort to gain access to individuals' emails. Uh, there is even a web a firm, an, a legal firm, e and &E Legal, that specializes in FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, for individuals' emails and all kinds of other documents. Uh, it specializes in this, and its slogan is free market environmentalism through strategic litigation. What a phrase. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to skip that one in the interest of time. But the, you know, one of the ways that this uh, disinformation campaign tries to undermine the results of science, the claim that the search for funding is what uh, 
motivates scientists to create uh, somehow false understanding of climate change and make it seem more urgent than it is. So uh, I just want to focus on for, for just a minute and then I'll stop. The campaign to remove information about climate change is old and to present disinformation. What has been new in the Trump era were efforts to cut the inputs to climate science, not just the outputs, but the inputs to delete instruments like these satellite instruments and other uh, and cut budgets so that we simply know less. You know, this is what Robert Proctor famously calls agnotology, the deliberate production of ignorance. And as I to, to end this, what I want to point out is that that sense of um, a relationship between truth and loyalty to an individual is really a very old way of thinking about what truth is, and it's supported by the 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 worldwide movement that we have seen in the last few years toward a new era of kind of strongman leaders like Trump, like Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, in the UK and elsewhere. So the, the, the concept is that we've been moving toward an idea that truth is a relationship between individuals and strong leaders and what they say about something becomes a, a new gauge of truth in the modern era. So I could say a lot more about this, but I want to uh, respect the time of my fellow panelists and I will stop at that point. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Paul for uh, this fascinating talk and um, and uh, so also exemplary in terms of um, both uh, passing out the, the different meanings of truth and truth and, and I think we, we will want to know what's what's in a little letter uh, there you know what's the difference maybe between truth and truth but also exemplary in, in holding off to our time and then leaving time for conversation. So uh, uh, I, will, I would like to um, invite now Mayana to um, um, uh, present. All right, thank you. Um, so let me get my screen on here. So the, and thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to be with colleagues. I, um, the title of my talk is Beyond the Status Quo, Is a New Science Possible? And I won't answer that question, but I think a certain uh, urgency will come through in, in, in my focus. So I will kind of take the bull by the horns and talk about the politics of producing knowledge uh, in in the field of climate, climate change. Um, so I'm an ethnographer of science and I've studied this for decades. And I think what I wanna share is a, is a concern and, and, and such you know, a fascination, but also a concern about the, the, the muffling that I think we do and that we have on debates um, that, that forecloses certain knowledges and certain debates that we really need to have. Um, so, I will I refer here to a costly bargain. Um, and what I'm referring to is that what I see is that in responses to anti-environmental attacks, the progressive movements, environmental movements have strengthened, have sort of lined out around uh, the, the sort of the Metonian uh, idealist theory in the sociology of science and broader society, so in the politics. Um, and so, we have to defend the science. If the science is attacked, we have to defend it. And this has reduced recognition of what I think is most urgently needed, which is understanding knowledge as inherently social and political. But I know that that is the crux of the question. Um, and many people think that that's too dangerous. 
Uh, but I argue that not doing this legitimates a researcher enterprise, which we've seen for three decades at this point, dedicated to diagnosing biogeochemical dynamics above all, overwhelmingly, um, in terms of also science funds, and in which credibility and prestige require, or so the scientists who are participating in the environmental assessments think, uh, policy neutrality and objectivity. Um, and I want to bring in our dear uh, Sheila Jasanoff here saying it is liberals now who have lost sight of the social context um, of, of truth claims. So something has happened here. So, so liberals losing that sight. So um, I went back to a text by Sal Restrivo in the handbook of SDS uh, from 1995. And at that time, so in the mid nineties, he perceived um, he talked about, he reflected on said the const constructivist paradigm, which many people think is the core of science technology studies, um, seems to be retreating or waning, whereas we have a return of the Metonian paradigm. Um, and he muses on that. So some people think that the constructivist um, wave was a grave error. Um, but he's also saying that what we need to understand is that science, and this is the big insight from the history of science, of how science is intimately connected to power, to economic political power, and traditionally very much to elites. And so it's the Marxist or the conflict theory that has been, but it has resided. Now, when Sheila made her claim in, 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 from that interview that, um, that I quoted her from, she says that it's because there've been these advances of science and that it's been so formidable, made great advances. And that's absolutely part of it. And she says climate change is the prime area um, for, you know, as, as an example of that. But it is clearly also the, the very much influenced by the politics. So what happened exactly the year that Restivo's, you know, chapter was, um, was published in the handbook was when you also had the Republicans in, in the United States took over Congress and you had a concerted attack among the Republicans on the science. So here we had the Republican Rohrbacher who was heading the science committee of the 104th Congress saying climate change, climate science is at best you know, uh, unproven and at worst a liberal claptrap. So this, what I see happening at that time is that we had this big attack on the science and then the, we, we, the battle became about the technical detail, details of the science, the scientific records, and what happened among sort of the, 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 the defenders of the environment, the ones really wanting to see a, a environmental policy, including social scientists, was we need to defend the science. So that is what has happened. And, and what has fascinated me and also, uh, you know, it well, is, for example, here you see on the, on the right, that is even science technology scholars started thinking that we should not critically examine the mainstream science. Um, and so you had a whole report for, uh, to the National Science Foundation or by the National Science Foundation by people in so environmental sociology. And they outlined all of the many, many contributions that social scientists or sociologists can make in this area. Um, and they entirely left out, I mean, uh, the possibility of critical examination of the mainstream science. Um, so what we have and what we have to understand is there is this, um, that, that the optimal trust is actually a mixture of trust and distrust. So whereas there's been this rising in, in notion that if we just get more trust in science, then there will be action. But actually that comes with some um, maladies in itself. If there's too much trust, is actually uh, undermines what is so beneficial about the trust relationship. It can, it tends to involve in a capture between scientists and policymakers, whereby certain sources of science are, are, are privileged. And, and um, so it's a very comfortable relationship, but what gets left out are other lines of research. And also what has happened is that then there's less recognition in the social sciences and generally about the dangers of this excessive trust, right? So um, an example of then what, I mean, here's an example of how, you know, how it, it what happens in this context. 
if you have a kind of capture. So there is a comfortable relationship, one would say, relatively speaking, between decision makers and environmental assessments, which are almost all, all dedicated not to how do we act on the basis of this science. So on what are, and what are the social, what are the social, political, economic obstacles to actually acting on this, these diagnoses of biogeochemical uh, realities that we've now had for three decades. Instead, we keep having more and more assessments and they diagnose the problems, but we're not learning much to about how do we really act? You know, what are the deeper reasons for why there is not, you know, not more, more, uh, more action? So here, what you have here is um, there was a study by Overland Sobokol that just came out and they studied science funding, climate science funding in 37 countries from 1990 to 2018. And they found that um, that 770 percent more funding went to the natural sciences compared to the social sciences and that in the area of mitigation only 0.12 percent of the total funding went to mitigation social science on mitigation and yet you will have you see the article behind here by Heidi Hackman you know voices in the social sciences say wait this is deeply you know, a social problem um, that, and therefore, you know, we need to understand those dy dynamics, but the overwhelming funding goes to the natural sciences. This is, this is an article that just came out uh, that I wrote with Esther Turnout and obviously quite um, uh, strong uh, title, how norms, needs and power and signs obstruct transformations towards sustainability. But this is after being an insider in science and seeing how even though there were like concerted efforts at certain points to change the science agenda so we would look more at these social obstacles um, that has been averted and it's partly by interest it's partly by norms it's a it's a, it's a confluence of things uh, but this talk about interest in science norms in science have been pushed underneath the carpet. We don't talk about it, we don't analyze it a lot. And there are some studies of the studies of the mainstream science, um, but not enough uh, to really, you know, to kind of expose and understand. And we need that is my argument for calibration of the science we, we need and also to move forward. So the argument in the art in the in the argument in the in our article is that rarely analyze mutually reinforcing power structures, interests, needs and norms within the institutions of global environmental change science obstruct rethinking and reform. And here we say that, and, and that they are shielded, all of this phenomenon is being shielded from scrutiny and change through the retreats behind the shield of neutrality and objectivity. And this shield is reinforced and justified by fears of abetting anti-environmentalism. So I think it's really important to think about what are the actually, what are all of the effects of these responses that we often don't talk about or that we rarely talk about um, uh, of these responses in this political politicized context of anti-environmentalism and the fear of those and a fear of abetting. Um, so I already mentioned that. And then in this context, for example, I wrote um, an article in 2013 where I argued that we do need to um, actually what is more, uh, what is better even for the environmental agenda ultimately is to have a more critical understanding of what science is. So that we do not have the idealized image of science, the Metonian idealized, you know, about norms and, you know, they real, really understand what's going on. And I won't go into the details of my argument uh, but I think it still very much holds because we can't hold the facade anyway. We have to understand science is social, but also that not looking behind the facade has deep consequences. And this is where I come from. If I'm addressing the politics straight on here, you know, living, uh, well, we all live in this world. We all know that there's been very little action for 30 years. Um, and also in Brazil, what I have seen. So this is, um, some research uh, that I've done uh, where I looked at none less than 12 years of the climate change mentioning articles in two major newspapers in Brazil. It amounted to a total of over 10,000 articles. And then I started looking at what they were actually focusing on, what did they frame as, as, as um, 
as, as um, sort of lifestyle problems or things that should change. But in that process, then I started looking and I started seeing that they, no one was talking about meat as a problem. So I started zeroing in on that. And I searched then for articles that would mention meat, uh, uh, even cows, et cetera, broad um, search. And so, and then I did a content analysis after that. But what I found that, so in all of these, more than 10,000 articles, there were a total of 20 um, articles that actually you know, talked about uh, critically about meat. There were brief references that were like 53 brief references, detailed paragraphs, kind of that really, and there you can see the examples of what we would count on the other, other end. But so all, almost no talk about what is actually the major source of greenhouse emissions in Brazil. So they would talk about deforestation, but they would not link it to anything about lifestyles, et cetera. So this warrants reflection on um, knowledge more broadly. So this is not just science, but what is the participation of scientists in this, in this, in the, in the amongst the solutions that were mentioned. So we also, you know, the, um, when the solution mentioned, there was a possible solution being to reduce meat consumption or meat production, um, only one Brazilian scientist made a brief reference and no Brazilian scientist was cited making a more detailed um, reference to that as a possible option. So, you know, that's a whole discussion in itself, you know, what are solutions for meat consumption and should Brazilians reduce it, but at least it should be discussed. And so this is where you actually end up seeing a very um, a repression on certain discussions and absolutely crucial discussions and that scientists are not always the ones who are speaking truth to power because when it surfaced, it was almost always foreigners. So there was a muffling by the newspapers and there was also a self-censuring on the parts of the scientists. And so this is something I'm thinking a lot about is, is, is about news and how um, we often don't talk about the political economy of the news media. And of course, we all know at one level that they are, but just how little that comes into the focus. You know, in the environmental assessments, do we talk about that? Do we talk about who gets to be, you know, to control, who has most access to the news media? Um, so at one level, we as academics, we know that. So I'm even a little kind of almost awkward bringing it up because we all know it. But at the same time, this is not shaping debates and it's becoming so invisible in the public realm that we don't really, we don't talk about this. And this is by, this is a quote by Robert McChesney from 2017 and confirming that. And he says, research on news as political institutions with its emphasis on political, economic and normative questions often has been marginalized in American mass communication scholarship. So that's even in the area of communication. Then think about, you know, in an area such as the IPCC, I mean, of climate, climate research, where we also, we still have a very, very narrow understanding of what communication uh, studies are, are relevant in the field, which is more as kind of a vehicle of, of communicating messages rather than understanding that it is constitutive of our reality and of our future because of how we understand the problems and then act on them. And here's an example. This was just on the 10th of April in the New York Times. Astonishing to have, you know, it's not surprising if you know about the ideologies of the news media, but this was an article about, um, which was putting as the possible options being between billionaires being the owners of newspapers and hedge fund owners. And then the billionaires were the better, but it was no political, it was actually like they were doing this as saviors of democracy um, and to show that they were civic minded. There was no critical thinking about why are they buying this or what are the consequences of this and how does this affect the public discourse, public understanding. So there is, you know, so I argue that even though we know many, you know, amongst our, us academics, that of course the political economy of the media matter, what is actually being said in the public realm um, is not showing that ref reflection enough at all. And this is one of my last few slides. Um, just wanna mention just that, and, and that is looking in the US in terms of you know, what is being, well, there's various levels to say, but the, what I'm 
let me just go to what I want to say about this, which is this was a, an investment in science in Brazil, a massive investment in the first half of the 2010s. Um, and it was to become a knowledge society, 18 areas of, of investment, and they were all technical, all natural science and technical science. Um, so if there's a limited, and this is also came out in the Overland and Sova cool, that they show that really environmental social science and humanities is all in, it, it's mostly a Northern phenomenon and the International so, uh, Social Science Council has also done research showing that. So if you go to like South America, that area is almost non-existent. And it really matters then for what is known and what is discussed. And then you'll have investment in a massive supercomputer but other areas are just, you know, left entirely blank. And I think about, you know, we we know what has happened in Brazil with the impeachment of Dilma in 2016, and this happened with a massive, massive uh, movement of the news media, uh, which was very blatantly biased and part of the plot, which has, you know, been exposed um, now through the, the car wash scandals or in the leaking of. I can't go into all the details, but we know that the, they, the news media were mobilized. So it is not a controversial fact. Um, and the one regret that the former president Lula had from prison, they would ask, did you regret this? Did you regret that? He regretted nothing. The one thing that he regretted was not having pushed through um, uh, reform of the mass media. And he had plans, but he did not do it. And my question and my, what I'm thinking about is, would it have mattered if we'd had, if Brazil had had a different science policy, if it had had social science and a space for also bringing in these critical questions about knowledge as deeply social through and through, um, which has gradually been, been getting lost even in the sociology of science, even in, by STS scholars. As I conclude, so, um, I see a bargain that has happened that promoters of, uh, of, of environmental policy or wishing to promote it, um, people have made this, gar this bargain. But what it does it, is that it reinforces the invisibility of the fact that even academics work in deeply ideological and silencing environments. And so it, it obstructs discussion about alternatives. And I've been thinking about this focus even on trust, distrust, um, because in my mind, I think we all travel very quickly to the hockey stick, um, to these technical facts, but it's not that, you know, we don't necessarily distrust the, these earnest scientists who are natural scientists, but it's a question of what kind of knowledge are they bringing, you know, distrust of who and for what, you know, I don't trust these scientists to bring in all of the perspectives that need to be on the table. I'm not even sure that, you know, citizen science will do that very quickly, uh, very well, I think. So, so there are some deeper questions about how can we get this recognition um, in a safe manner, but that's also sufficiently challenging to status quo, where we really understand this deep relationship between knowledge and power the insights from the history of science of that intimate relationship between knowledge and power. Um, and because, and I, and I think that ultimately the omissions may be more crucial. So in this case, the example that I used was the example of, of um, you know, that the political economy of the media is something we don't really talk about and it's not very comfortable somehow to talk about it. It seems very po you know, po po political and somehow should be outside of the scope. And so I put this uh, image of, a, of, a, of to end I, I get also with Sal Restivo, his, his book from 2011, where he is pro, he's, he's, he's probing for a new science. Is there a new science that can recognize these intimate relationships between knowledge and power um, and, and, and still be rigorous and, st and, and, and to help progressive change? Um, and it might be, the only way that we can get outside and not have another decade or two decades going before we really do more concerted action, as everyone says we should, but um, it is it is it is very hard to see how how to how to have that happen from the current scientific assessments, for example. I'll end there. <laughs>
why do more as you do you take over <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if you can hear me I, I, my computer died and I'm uh, on my phone um, we hear you Gil um, since I am uh, almost absent in action um, uh, uh, Thank you, Mayana, for this uh, provocative talk. I'm sure there's going to be uh, uh, quite a bit of a discussion about it. I already saw several questions in the Q&A line. Uh, but Peter, why don't you uh, take over um, and Aaron will um, sh uh, show your slides. Peter, you're muted. Okay. You hear me now? We can. No, I'm okay. Uh, I just want to say, as a you know, as a starting, the the slides I'll show. Uh, some of them have German uh, titles, so disregard those because uh, I'll <clears throat> translate them for you, so to speak. Um, and also, uh, I will uh, use uh, with these slides, I will, I will uh, have reference to various different uh, surveys. Uh, I, I know that that is a methodological no-no, uh, but uh, just pardon me for this uh, context. Um, you'll see my point uh, that I'm going to make, uh, and it doesn't really matter if we were always relying on the same survey. Anyway, uh, first the question of trust, oh no, wait a minute, I, I should also mention that the background for what I'm going to tell you uh, is uh, a project uh, that has to do with uh, uh, reactions or the relationship between science and uh, politics uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, there will be some references to that, um, but uh, the climate change is, so to speak, the, the, the primary focus. Uh, but the, the <clears throat> comparison between uh, the pandemic, uh, the, the public's reaction to the pandemic and the relationship of uh, the politicians uh, to scientists uh, during the pandemic, uh, are very instructive also for the uh, uh, case of uh, trust and science in, in uh, climate science. So anyway, let me let me start by saying that um, trust and science, and this is slide, this first slide, i.e., the next one here. Uh, that uh, just uh, is shows that the trust in science as an institution is quite stable over time. Contrary to uh, you know, a lot of concerns that um, the public doesn't trust science, uh, this is actually not the fact. But um, <clears throat> the problem is that half the time we don't even know what we're measuring. In other words, uh, and uh, that uh, is coming out in the next slide, um, the, the concept of trust. Most surveys just ask, do you trust science? And then they're having some other uh, additional questions and, and trying to sort of pinpoint what is meant by trust. But actually, uh, that is probably uh, uh, not helping a lot. <clears throat> I'm presently involved in a project where we try to uh, pin down, so to speak, the various aspects of trust and uh, this in fact is uh, a slide this slide is from a doctoral student who just finished her dissertation uh, on exactly that issue i just want to point to that uh, that we, although we we're not sure what we're actually asking when we when we ask do you trust science uh, i'll still go on and pretend as if we do because most surveys, uh, of course, ask similar questions. Now, trust can change, trust in science can change dramatically when you turn to particular issues. In other words, when you turn from institutions to uh, say climate science uh, or uh, 
uh, nuclear fission or radiation, this kind of thing, or nanotechnology, whatever you take. In other words, uh, <clears throat> it, there's a, a, a decisive difference between the perception that people have of science as an institution, which is very general uh, and has very little to do with their daily lives and concrete uh, issues such as uh, climate change or, for that matter, the corona pandemic. Um, there is uh, uh, the, the, the fear of climate change uh, and uh, there's also a fear of pandemic, which it turns out, or would, both of which turn out to be quite decisive. The, the fear of climate change, 93% uh, of EU citizens consider climate change as serious and still 79% a very serious uh, problem. Uh, and if we look for the data in Germany, and this is the next slide, uh, then we see how during the first months of the pandemic last year, that level of fear rose uh, quite a lot, uh, and, um, uh, and perhaps you uh, show the next slide uh, where you see how it changed over time during the whole year. And uh, as you remember, there was a first wave, which of course uh, generated uh, a higher level of fear. Then it uh, sort of dissipated over the, over the summer. Uh, until the, the second wave came in uh, September and uh, more so in October and November. Uh, so we can see that the level of fear uh, follows uh, what the population perceives as, uh, from the news, most of it, uh, of course, uh, perceives as a threat to their own health. Um, can we see the next slide? Uh, here you see, and I have to translate that uh, to you, uh, the, the question here is which crisis has in the long term greater uh, impact? Uh, and uh, the green one, 17% uh, is uh, Corona. The blue one is climate, the climate crisis. And 23% think uh, that there's no difference between the two. Uh, so you see that uh, actually, uh, even though the corona crisis is, so to speak, more imminent, the threat is much more imminent, uh, the climate crisis is very much uh, on the minds of people. Um, so uh, when you go to the next slide, um, we see that how the fear of, or, or yeah, the, the fear of the threat of climate, uh, uh, climate change compared to other issues. You see that climate change actually it is the, the one that is feared most, uh, more than BSE, gene food, uh, smoking, uh, uh, and uh, nuclear power plants, and so on. Uh, this is, uh, again, a survey uh, in... Um, in Germany and uh, may not be generalizable to other countries, but it just shows that uh, there, there is a perception of these issues <clears throat> and differentiation between these issues. 55% um, according to a survey, 59% of Germans think that climate change will have greater effect on the economy uh, and society than the corona pandemic. Uh, and a further 23% think that the long-term effects will be equal. Uh, the, the, uh, well, this slide shows the, the uh, differences uh, of uh, perception of risk. Uh, an EU survey, 92% uh, think that it is important that their governments formulate ambitious goals to increase the share of renewable energy. 89% hold that their government should support measures to improve energy efficiency until 2030. 
92% agree that the greenhouse gas emissions should be reduced to a minimum and that the EU industry should be climate neutral. Again, this shows that uh, sort of the, the, the fear of climate change uh, is uh, very high and, and, and very uh, present. Now, the question then is how are these perceptions formed? We have a study from the uh, Academy of uh, uh, Technology Assessment uh, in, in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, they came out uh, and said it rests on four pillars. Uh, there is primary uh, personal experience uh, that plays a prominent role. Uh, there is uh, an evaluation of climate change uh, as a slowly emerging very high risk of potentially catastrophic damage. Uh, and here the emphasis is also on, on slowly emerging uh, in contrast, for instance, uh, to, to the pandemic. Um, there is a, a causal logic of climate change. Uh, only 11% think that, that they themselves are responsible for climate change, but rather it is industry uh, or government that is held responsible. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, when it comes to solutions, only a few see the solution in themselves, i.e. ride a bike to, to work, uh, but rather uh, most see it in government regulation. Uh, the fear of, and this is the next slide then, um, the, the fear of threat of the threat induces trust in science, at least in the case of Corona. Uh, here you see how the, the level of trust of, in science rose uh, when the pandemic started. That is in April 2020, we had the first uh, uh, survey uh, uh, from um, a major uh, company that's uh, specialized in surveys on, on trust and science. Uh, and that gives you 36% uh, trust science a lot, 37 still trust science, and then comes those from those who are either indifferent or uh, distrust science. So, so the level of trust uh, increased considerably following again uh, the uh, development uh, of the uh, of the um, pandemic. Now, uh, the question, what role should science play in government decisions is very interesting to follow uh, here during the pandemic and of course can also be compared uh, with uh, the role of government in uh, mitigating climate change. 93% uh, think it would be good or very good of, if opinions and analyses of science would be included in decision-making processes. More strongly than so far, uh, i.e. to the protection uh, of the climate. <clears throat> overwhelming, a, an overwhelming majority in favor of including science. It's the next slide. Uh, there we see that uh, uh, the, the line on top says, uh, including science um, uh, by politics and the public. 55% uh, uh, would think that it is very positive to include science. 38% uh, still think it's good and only 5% are opposed. Uh, or critical of that. Um, now, there's a lot of discussion uh, about, uh, and uh, Paul mentioned some of that, the, the threat or the, uh, the efforts to uh, sow disinformation and the likes the, in communication science, or more so even in, in psychology. The question is, how can you convince climate skeptics uh, or uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, skeptics, how can you convince them? Uh, and uh, often the answer is a rational argument. Uh, if, you, if we turn to the next slide, we see uh, that 
there is this, this is a very well-known curve here, how Democrats and Republicans in the US react to uh, evidence of climate warming. And you see that, uh, you, you know, famously, uh, the Republicans uh, are uh, having a lot of distrust, whereas the Dem Democrats are uh, in favor. Now, the, the, the graph on the right side uh, actually has a very interesting result, and that is the uh, put the, the, the sort of the, speak the degree of polarization uh, of the uh, of the public. Uh, and there you see that in the US, the polarization, the left to right difference, as it is called there, is the highest in the US. And then as you go down the list, uh, you end up in, the, say, the Netherlands or Poland, Brazil, uh, in France, where it's almost not existent. Now, showing you the next slide, uh, you'll see um, this is, of course, the famous uh, two curves, again, blue and red, but this time having uh, the reaction to uh, the threat of COVID-19. Again, the same uh, reaction to the pandemic and how seriously it is being taken, but influenced by party affiliation, or which could also be translated, I guess, into ideological conviction. And the next slide uh, shows the same for Germany, uh, although with some indirect uh, data, but you'll see at the bottom uh, and the, the, the question on top is, uh, uh, was this year 2020 a, an especial, a, a very special and uh, eventful year? And how do you look back on it? And uh, then on, on the right side, uh, it says uh, the um, intention to elect or to vote. Uh, and uh, those who say that the year was uh, very positive are on the left, and those that say it's negative are on the right. And you'll see the blue line. Those people are the 82.5% that are inclined to vote for the AFD. Uh, compare them to the 59% that are inclined to vote for the SPD. The SPD is the Social Democratic Party, i.e. left liberal left, you could say, the AFD or the, the, the right extreme, the extreme right. So you have the same polarization and uh, the, the next uh, slide again shows that uh, this was a, 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 um, a, a survey that was taken on people who are inclined uh, who, who are critics of, of uh, the uh, measures uh, that were taken to mitigate COVID. Uh, and uh, again, this is the inclination to vote for which party and the AFD is in second place. The others, the first ones are all parties that are way out uh, on, of the uh, regular spectrum. So, um, and uh, uh, the pattern, in other words, uh, the, the, the ideological polarization, uh, say in Germany and the US, is not that different. And obviously, people have problems in, in trying to convince those who are ideologically uh, uh, very uh, sort of stabilized in their opinions. Uh, rational arguments do not help a lot. Now, uh, what can we conclude from all this? Um, the, uh, during the early phase of the pandemic, uh, the, the German government relied very much on the advice of scientific experts, uh, almost uh, sort of hiding behind them. Uh, compare that with Trump, uh, who uh, finally called Anthony Fauci an idiot. Um, but as the pandemic went on and developed, uh, both trust and science and the approval of the government sort of eroded. Uh, 
not least because the political measures were beginning to, uh, to become politicized uh, and, uh, and, and moved away from the expert advice. We couldn't test that for climate change, but in the future, it will be a very interesting project uh, to look at that. And the problem uh, that we have here is that apparently a majority of the population uh, in, in, with differences between countries, uh, but a majority of the population, the, the greater the threat and the more immediate the threat, the more they are inclined to accept an expert uh, rule. Uh, but as soon as the threat dissipates, uh, politicization hit, uh, hits again. So that, that is a mixed message for democratic theory. Uh, and uh, we might discuss that. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Peter, for um, uh, bringing us a, a different side, the, the public side of the, of the um, of the debate. Um, uh, next, we have our two um, uh, fellows of the seminar, uh, doctoral candidates, uh, Musa al Galbi and Aaron Plasek. Each of you, um, I'll have uh, Musa go first and then Aaron, um, one after the other, I'll present your questions and then you know the panelists can, can respond. So Musa, why don't you start? You're muted. No, I think you're not muted. Your mic may not be working. You might have selected the wrong mic. Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you all for um, great talks um, and, and provocative readings as well. Um, one thing that I noticed as I was uh, listening to the talks, and especially um, that became especially pronounced in the in the in the readings you circulated ahead of time, um, there seems to be this interesting tension between the the arguments of Dr. Lawson and Dr. Edwards. So uh, both of you recognize that there are positives and negatives involved with increasing transparency and accountability and expanding participation in climate science. However, Dr. Edwards focuses primarily on the risks and costs, particularly to the authority of climate scientists or to the integrity of climate data. Dr. Lawson, meanwhile, recognizes that opening up imposes some costs to the um, authority of climate science and does pose some risks with respect to empowering bad actors, but she argues on balance, it would actually be perhaps good for our ability to effectively respond to environmental change if the dominance of climate science and climate scientists was displaced a bit in public discussions in favor of better emphasizing the social dimensions of the problem, and how to address it, um, and indeed the social dimensions of knowledge production itself. There's also an important difference with respect to the discussion of conflicts of interest in, the, in these two um, presentations and papers. So Dr. Edwards seems to um, largely dismiss the suggestion that climate science may have, uh, climate scientists may have com such conflicts of interest primarily by um, emphasizing that many of those who are leading the charge to criticize climate science um, on these grounds have even worse con conflicts of interest, right? They're often funded by petrol companies and right-wing donors, et cetera. I don't think Dr. Lawson would disagree with this assessment per se, but she also does compellingly describe how there do seem to be important conflicts of interest that urgently need to be addressed with respect to government research allocations, institutionalized understandings, um, the prevailing uh, approaches and frameworks for discussing uh, the problem and what's to be done about it. That is, there's a broad harmony between the portraits that uh, painted by Drs. Lawson and Edwards, but there's also important, and I think a productive tension 
Uh, and so I was hoping that um, the panelists could speak a little bit about the tensions around these roughly compatible yet importantly different pictures that were painted with respect to conflicts of interest and the trade-offs that come with transparency and inclusion. Please, Aaron. Oh, no, I wanted, I wanted to hear their answers first before I ask. <laughs> It. It, will, it will influence my question and how, how I want to phrase it. So if people don't mind, uh, maybe maybe answering the question first, and then I will, I will follow up after that. Sure, sure. Wonderful. Um, Mayanna or Paul, uh, one of you could start. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Why don't you go first, since you heard, I, I don't. Well, so yeah, yeah. I think we're you know we're focusing on different aspects of a problem. I, you know, I I don't. I think it's good that we have more transparency about how the physical science is conducted. Good in a way that you know one of the things that is really visible in the last twenty years is that. Uh, tools for using and analyzing climate data have become much more widely available. And that this is true of anything because uh, we have so many commodity tools like Excel spreadsheets and uh, uh, open source statistics packages and so on. So you get a lot of interpretation of data by non-experts and it can be produced in forms that will look very professional. So it's what we see coming out of that transparency is partly a huge proliferation of alternative analyses of data and very little uh, way for a general audience to distinguish between the, those that are done by professionals who understand the causality in the relationships they're analyzing and those done by amateurs who don't understand that and have, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So, you know, that's kind of the, the downside to transparency is the cacophony of uh, results that are challenged, but not necessarily challenged in a meaningful way. And yet the challenges seem meaningful to anyone looking at it from the outside. And we see this, you know, all over the place around the COVID pandemic too, that Peter was talking about, you know, people have very different responses, especially to statistics. And I could go on about this for a long time. I mean, you know, one of the things that, uh, I mean, Andy Revkin has brought up in the chat, the IPCC uncertainty language, and that's the thing I'd love to talk about more. Uh, people are not good at interpreting statistics. Even scientists are not very good at interpreting statistics. So we have this form of knowledge that we're using all over the place that is easily contested by people with without a lot of causal understanding and the end result uh, is always new statistics that are difficult for anyone to interpret. So, uh, you know, you know that. I think I'll stop there. And let Mayanna talk. Uh, um, let, let me just say one thing about the social science versus uh, natural science. You know, it's absolutely true that natural science has more prestige, and natural scientists view themselves as being more uh, grounded and more prestigious than people in the social sciences. I, you know, it's just a, uh, it seems like a law of nature <laughs> in the scientific world. Uh, and that's, you know, the, 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 that's been an issue with, for example, the IPCC all along, partly because of that arrogance that's present, but also partly because of the, there's, a, there's a flow of natural science knowledge to the social science side, to the economists and the sociologists and others who are trying to interpret what climate change would mean. And that's, you know, it's kind of a necessary ordering of a process, but what it comes at, the way it appears to the public is more like you have this, you know, this natural science results come out first and earliest and then we get, begin to get the things about adaptation and mitigation and what we can do about it. And those are less uh, central in the analysis often than, than the natural science results. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. 
Um, yeah, I think I think uh, nice to 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 capture that tensions and those tensions, and I perceive those as well. And you know, it it takes reflection. Okay, transparency. But um, the the 2013 paper that I that I refer to of mine on climate gate. The argument I make is basically we almost don't have a choice. I mean that the the stake if we don't have more transparency is that we make we we have this idealized image of science and then you actually make science more vulnerable. So you could argue that this whole emphasis on objectivity makes science more vulnerable. You know that's a kind of a trap in itself um, because we we then science has to and everyone is operating to maintain this, this, this pretense that science is not also about social relations or that it is social relations and that it is social through and through. And I understand that that is threatening, but ultimately I don't know how much of a choice we really have if we want to get further. So as much as it's uncomfortable at a certain level, I mean, what I've seen is that, is that you know, we tend to think, and this is so implicit among uh, environmental sociologists that somehow, you know, and this was when, when Salvesi was said, some, th some people think that the constructivism was a grave error. This is kind of an implicit cultural knowledge among environmental sociologists that I've run up to. And they, they think that science studies uh, scholars are naive if they will deconstruct the science. Um, but I think that it's it's almost the other way around. I think if we don't do it, we're leaving, we're putting up this facade. So we don't really have, at a certain level, there's not a choice. But the other thing is that we end up falling into this trap of um, of maintaining the scientific hierarchy like that, that, that Paul was just referring to. We're feeding it, we're maintaining it, and there's, we're never going to be done with the diagnosis of the biogeochemical. You know, and at another level, it's much more scientific. If we can have more transparency, actually people, then we have more, if we have STS studies of the mainstream science, we will see some of the belly of the beast and some of these things that are less pretty. But I don't think, I think what we can get is an, a kind of asymmetry through symmetry. Okay, in the sense that if we actually analyze critically let's say both sides. I think there's more than two sides on this, but let's say the anti-environmentalist sort of uses and you know, of science and the, the, you know, the non-IPCC and the IPCC. If we study both of them critically, you can end up with a non-symmetry um, because I think you'll see the earnestness of the scientists as a whole of the mainstream in what they're doing. And this has come out in some reactions to my work because you know that Wow, you can really see that. So I've studied the climate modelers and I show how they struggle with being seduced by their own models, but you also see how they really strive to get it right, you know, and they mm -hmm. struggle against that tendency. Whereas when you go to the, you know, to the, to the contrarian scientists, you see a persistent, you know, sort of wall against, you know, reflection against, you know, so it's, and, and you see a very clear distortions. So we actually end up with, with asymmetry through the symmetry, but people are afraid of doing that. So um, yeah, and I think this point about being more scientific actually, if we have information to calibrate, you know, what the mainstream sciences say. And so I, I think in the end, what we're having is a non-scientific science agenda to the extent that we do not put this kind of research much more front and center. Peter, please. Uh, Peter, I, I see your hand is up. So, I just want to make one comment on that uh, transparency. The, the 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 pandemic uh, gave us a nice experiment. The scientists had to sort of reverse their uh, either reverse their uh, their uh, analysis uh, and their advice, uh, or they had to just admit that they didn't know because indeed the virus was new. Uh, they didn't have any knowledge about it, uh, and they didn't know how it spread, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, that increased their credibility. There, there are multiple surveys that found out that uh, they believed the experts who on TV, one is a particularly prominent one, uh, who has a blog, in fact, uh, and uh, who repeatedly said, I don't know, we, we, we have to wait, et cetera, et cetera the most believed person uh, on TV there. Let me just make one more comment on this question because 
you know, Mayanna, you probably know this, but uh, Jessica O'Reilly is doing a project on the current IPCC report. She is uh, has been participating in all three working groups and watching, you know, the sort of doing a, a sort of ethnographic study, interviewing hundreds of the people involved. And she won't be able to write about it until the report is out, but that is coming out in uh, the summer. So we will get that for the first time. And that was a direct response to the kind of criticism that you're talking about that, you know, there, there should be more investigation and, and, you know, public understanding of how that process works. If I can, I, I, I'm aware of that and I know some of the work and I think that is a very good addition. It is a little problematic the way that has been handled in the sense of, you know, there are chosen people who are somehow the, the trusted ones who can do it. So there's still a kind of a, a, a you know, a, a control on how that is done from, you know, as I see it. Um, I think it's, I think that works. I still see also in the science um, or as it gets um, presented these things, you know, that there's a, then, um, these studies so far have not really talked about scientist interests, right? So if you take uh, discerning experts by Oppenheimer and all, I think it's very nice how they actually, they do capture very well sort of these preconceptions among the scientists that they absolutely must for their credibility, they need to be objective and not be policy prescriptive. Um, but we don't get very further than that, I think, in that work, you know, than recognizing that that is how the scientists think. And, anyway, and I think that is, that is valuable. But there's also, I think, more additional steps, you know, that are not being made in terms of, you know, how, you know, so again, like the interest, we don't really talk about that. Or if you take a study like Lewandowski with Oreskes, where they did the sea pitch, um, I refer to that in the article on norms and, and, and power in, in science, they, they will see um, that there is a, they won't talk about interest. They will talk about sort of an unconscious effect of the anti-environmentalists anti on, um, uh, on their science. Um, the, the analysts will mention this, but they won't see, see it as interest, right? So, I mean, that's fine. I think it's still much better than nothing. And I like that work. Um, I'm just always interested in where we go and where we don't go, right? And so from there, so then they unconsciously, the scientists unconsciously are reacting to the influence of anti-environmentalism, but we don't talk about, are there also interests in science that are actually, and, and I, I think those interests, you know, this is what I map in that article um, that just came out. You know, they are very, very strong. They are very strong interest in maintaining the science institutions as we have them. And we have a big problem because there's been institutions that are dedicated to diagnosing biogeochemical realities. And that's what they do. So what do we do with all of that capacity if we really were to argue that now we need to focus much more, you know, or at least dedicate half of the funding to social science? Are we going to reduce the science funding for the natural sciences, or are we going to beef up even more the, the, the science budget? I think those are the critical questions that, you know, that we're not, that we're not talking about. So um, I, Musa clearly has stirred the pot very nicely. Um, there's also six questions waiting in the Q&A, but let's, uh, let Aaron also add his, um, you know, stirring the pot. I'll try to be as, as brief as I can. Um, so in trying to understand the tensions between Dr. Edwards uh, and Dr. Lawson's um, talks, right? Because there is a tension there, I agree with Musa. Um, and, and trying to understand how can I actually begin to unravel that tension or understand what that tension is. Um, I, I, thinking about uh, Dr. Edwards' talk, uh, this notion of truth, right? Uh, as that kind of trust, right? Uh, and he says like, uh, work, uh, work despite disagreement, right? We might think of truth as, a uh, a, a, a repertoire of strategies to manage disagreement, to, to, uh, to get past, to act despite disagreement, right? Um, and it occurs to me that um, we might be talking about very different scales of sociality, right? Like if I'm in a lab trying to get uh, an instrument to measure something, it's incredibly difficult to get anything to work in a lab, ever, right? Uh, and, and so like at one level, we're talking about, you know, there, there's a sort of trust in the instruments themselves. Can I get the instruments to work 
can I get my colleagues in the same lab to agree that my instrument is working and doing what I think it does, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's a level of, you know, uh, publication uh, with, uh, within, you know, research communities uh, locally or nationally or internationally, right? Um, then there's I, uh, ideas about the institution of science, right? So when we talk about, um, so in Dr. Lawson's talk, uh, when we talk about, you know, attacks on science or like Mertonian versus uh, constructivist approaches to science, really what we're talking about the institutions of science, right? The idea of science as an institution, um, right? Uh, and it seems to me there, trust is something very different, right? When we're talking about trust. So for instance, there's this beautiful graph of optimal trust is not total trust. Well, in some contexts, I know exactly what that graph means. And I'm like, oh, that is lovely, right? And it seems to be more like the institutional scale of trust uh, or, or even like a, a uh, uh, geographically dispersed notion of trust, right? But that seems very different than a notion of trust when I'm working you know, with statistical packages and I'm trying to make an instrument work, right? Uh, when I'm trying to convince my colleagues within my research field that all mostly agree with me, right, uh, about a particular point. Uh, right. Um, so, so very different notions of trust. And actually, this this sort of uh, this is sort of the reiteration, in some ways, of of what Dr. Weingart uh, mentioned in his talk, which is when we ask people, you know, do you have trust in science over time? What the hell does trust mean? Uh, and in fact, it means a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, and so, I, I think there's an element here of uh, uh, an act of trying to represent or describe the world and how that's a very different act than trying to intervene in the world. I think scientists try to do both of those things at different times. Um, and I think part of understanding what we mean by trust is understanding which one of those acts we're doing. I'm thinking of like you're representing and intervening, right? Um, but uh, in order to try to tease out this notion of trust a little bit more, uh, again, I think we come back to this, this notion of transparency and what kinds of values are being on display when we invoke transparency. Because if truth means different things at these different scales of sociality, then surely transparency also means different things at different levels of uh, sociality, right? Um, and so it's, transparency is like a, a, an epi epistemic concept, right? It's a rhetorical concept. Uh, and so to try to get at what these different forms of truth are in, in these different talks, um, I'd like to inquire again about transparency to, to ask you, can you come up with specific examples where transparency is invoked by a, a community or a scholar? Uh, and then the way in which transparency is invoked actually uh, works against that actor's interests, right? Because if transparency is really a powerful concept, if it really tracks truth in the way that it, I think it might, um, then it should be sort of uncontrollable. It should be unpredictable, right? Uh, Think for code, right? Uh, how power works in, in many different ways, right? And so if transparency is this thing that we're all anchoring uh, the value of science to, um, are there examples that you can provide or would like to provide uh, in which transparency like does something different than, than what people expected it to do? Uh, so it's kind of a, a general question, but I hope, hope it's interesting to you. So thank you again, uh, everyone, for your talk. I really enjoyed them. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. To continue the culinary metaphor, if Musa still the pot, you started asking, you know, what, what exactly are we cooking here? What kind of a dish is this? Um, what is trust? What is transparency? Which kind are you talking about? Uh, anybody um, from our three panelists can, can jump in. Um, well, the, so that was a really interesting and complicated <laughs> comment, Aaron. So <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can get to, to everything there. I mean, First thing I would put on the table is that I don't think transparency is a value by itself. And I think that's really important. You know, if you have ever been in a faculty meeting, you know, or any kind of meeting where a decision has to be made, you know, and then been presented with petitions and, uh, you know, have an entire university come down on you for a decision that, that you made, uh, you understand why sometimes you need to just hole up with a group, make a choice and put it out there without exposing every piece of the process. It's a, it, you know, human institutions cannot function without closed door meetings, you know, so I'll just put that on the table. That, that said, you know, the kind of transparency that, that natural scientists are talking about today is often, you know, publication of models and data. And you asked for an example. The hockey stick story is a great example of that because uh, Michael Mann resisted for a considerable time publishing his uh, the code 
for his um, uh, uh, you, you know that he used to produce those those crafts. He said, you know, that's my intellectual property. That's that's the work. That's what I do. You know, if you want to uh, if you want to see the code, uh, I, I'm not going to show it to you, but I've I've written up the al algorithm, and you can write your own code. You know. So, but he, he was forced in the end by the kind of general zeitgeist of, of this era to do that. And that has also happened with uh, climate model codes of all kinds, they've been exposed. Um, that hasn't in the end had much effect as that I know of because those codes are so complicated that, that very few people feel competent to comment on them. And they're right, you know, it's, it's just way too complex for, most people to intervene in those kinds of uh, issues. So, you know, uh, there is definitely a circle the wagons kind of mentality that comes up in, I mean, I've been participating in the IPCC in this round. I'm part of the sixth assessment report for working group one, uh, writing mostly about the history of the science, but, you know, I participate in everything. And, it, you know, it is visible that there is a sense well, what are the skeptics about this, these issues gonna say? How should we present things so that that, you know, to insulate ourselves from uh, uh, criticism? Now, is that wrong? Does that express an interest in the way that Mayanna is talking about it? You know, there's always, for somebody like me, the risk of capture, you know, I've been involved in this process, I like my colleagues, I, you know, there, there's all that kind of thing. But to the extent that I can be objective about what I'm seeing, I would say no, it's not actually a, a, an expression of an interest, but more of a sense of what are, you know, we have to defend against all kinds of uh, positions that disagree with ours uh, from within science. So when it comes at us from outside science, from people who want to, you know, attack the results and have a, you know, a, a strong interest in doing that, that is not a scientific interest, but a political one. Um, that's just one more check on a process that should be, that ought to be checked in such a way. Okay. Um, okay, well, so yeah, it's hard to, to come with a clear answer because there was a lot going on in that question. Um, if I can respond to this issue about interest, for me, I don't really see the interest as operating through the circling of the wagons. That's a sort of sociological phenomenon that I see happening. And I do understand that. Um, I do see social processes, which is kind of similar to a cancel culture. You know, you overstep the boundary. So there is something about not giving. So people are, I think social scientists are poli policing themselves in what they do. And I think that can be harmful to the progress of idea and the progress of debate. So I think there's something dangerous about having these kinds of considerations too much behind closed doors, because there is this, you know, so, so I see interest working at another level, which is, which is about prestige. It's about the science budgets more than anything. Um, and, and, but I think that it's dangerous to have people who are not really trained in politics to be making a lot of calculations about how this may play out. Um, I tend to say we should just be try to be more transparent you know, allow more diversity within. And this is also a conclusion that comes out in discerning experts that, you know, after, so the people who have studied the scientific assessments also find, also question, should there be this emphasis on consensus, you know, on this united front? We can actually maybe allow more diversity to be seen, more debate to be had uh, without sacrificing the, the, the project of more environmental policy. I just think that it is a little dangerous to have too much of that kind of calculations behind closed doors. And I tend to think that it's counterproductive. I don't think that the anti-environmentalists should be given all the power that they've gotten. Um, I mean, when I, if, if, if really they're reinforcing this shield, I think that is much too much power to give them, that they actually 
paradoxically end up winning in what they wanted by shielding off certain debates, right? That there are certain things we don't end up not talking about if we keep the powers that be, be the powers that be. So I think there is a need to kind of shake things up a little bit. And this is not to be exposing anything that's going wrong. I mean, that's the irony of climate gate. There was huge, there were huge investigations and nothing really had been done wrong. So I don't think we need to be so, so guarded you know, as, as scientists. I don't think the, na the natural scientists need to be so guarded. And that's the irony of the whole thing. Um, so if you can leave it more open, there will be more debate, but we can also possibly get further um, in our discussions and in thinking about what kind of val what kind of knowledge is valuable. And this is picking up on some of the, the beginning part of your, of your question or your comments. Um, you know, as I've been thinking about this panel, this issue of trust, is it true? And we end up focusing so much on the technical details that we're not asking, well, what matters? You know, at what point do we think that it's, we know enough about the biogeochemical, uh, you know, uh, dynamics? And we need to think about what are the major sort of urgent questions that we need to figure out? So it's about, you know, shifting, not because it's, I mean, the science may be true. We may, you know, I don't question the science, you know, even on the Himalayas in the IPCC. I mean, I, as a whole, I trust that. But it doesn't mean that I think we should keep focusing there. And I wonder, how do we get out of that? How do we get on without opening up in some way? And how can that happen? Um, so that's the, that's the tricky part, as I see it. Question. I want to I want to pick up on some of the questions from from the audience. Um, so um, there's a the, there's a question by S Rowe, um, and the question is I think directed to Peter, uh, though obviously everybody else can uh, jump in on it. Um, the question is is the inactivity on climate change action really about trust, or is it about a combination of confirmation bias and support of it by siloed media viewing? Um, and economic interest in business as usual. I don't think I can answer you, you know, solidly because uh, that would require that we have data on uh, what's what's behind the answers and and how you know, that again here the issue comes up when you ask questions in a survey uh, unless we know pretty precisely what is triggered in terms of an answer by a certain question the leeway of interpreting what is meant is just uh, too great so I wouldn't, uh, I, I, I would hesitate to give you a sort of definitive answer. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, the, the word trust is very, that covers a lot of ground. I, you know, I tend to look for things, places where we can measure something that's connected to trust, you know, s such as behavior. <laughs> and that, you know, that brings up all the paradoxes of how people respond to the climate change issue. You know, it's a long term problem. So, yeah, maybe they believe the results, but do they do anything that indicates they are willing to pay for the, what must happen to, to fix that problem? So, you know, voting behavior is one thing, but that's not very good proxy because it uh, cover, you know, people vote for on all kinds of issues. They are never voting on just one issue. So it's, you know, Peter, go on. You, it looks like you have something to say here. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, that is why we had uh, in, in this project on, uh, on the pandemic, we also looked or primarily looked at how did people react to the measures that were t taken to mitigate uh, the pandemic? Because most of these measures are unconstitutional, are very hard on people, uh, you know, lockdowns and uh, sort of uh, shutting down the, the uh, restaurants and uh, theaters, et cetera, et cetera. And because that's in, in a sense, it's a test, how serious are they when they react? And the surprising finding is that the, the, um, the support of these measures uh, even 
did not erode dramatically for quite some time when the decisions themselves had become politicized and, and sort of speak, uh, veered away from, from scientific support. That, that is, uh, I mean, if, if there's any evidence uh, that we have in terms of behavioral reaction, then that is it, I think. Mm -hmm. And of course, for, with climate change, it's hard to get because the measures on climate change are very indirect. The threat is indirect, it's long term. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the most that would happen is perhaps, uh, say, if the government would go out and would say, and some of this, of course, does happen. Uh, you can't drive your car, your, your, your gas car, you know, uh, uh, what's it called, <laughs> your diesel or whatever. You can't drive that anymore, uh, say, beyond 2025. And uh, that's it. I mean, that would just have enormous reactions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes Mayanna, please. Uh, to that question, I think Brazil is a very good example to, to, to answer that. I mean, it's not really about trust. In Brazil, you don't have much questioning of the science is not the kind of question you see in the US, which is focused on, is it real? Is climate change real or not? Um, and does it have impact? That's accepted in Brazil by huge. I mean, Brazil Brazilians have topped the charts in terms of faith in science and going back decades at this point. You know, but what to me, and this is very relevant to my point about the media, if they're not told that meat is crucial, um, and what country, you know, a few countries can make as crucial, you know, decisions in on that topic than than Brazil but they don't make that connection. And that is shown, there are various indications that they do not make that connection. So they know it's about deforestation, you know, and the media are very much part of maintaining that. So, so, so again, we can produce amazing science and keep having the diagnosis. And we know very much that reducing uh, the production of meat is one of the biggest things we can do. That's also with the least, it's the least infrastructure intensive compared to energy. So it's easier to reduce emissions through reducing diets than it is to reduce, you know, energy in infrastructures. Not to say you should do both, but even in Brazil, there where they have power over, they don't know about it. So, you know, if we don't look at these information environments, it's kind of a higher level of environmental policy, then, you know, it doesn't make, you know, we're not gonna get very far. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe we can um, move ahead in, in the questions from the audience and, and we might not be able to get all of them, but uh, the next question is from Andy Refkin, uh, who will be on our, um, our next event and already engage you uh, in a <laughs> ongoing discussions. Um, less of a question, more of a comment, but I'm sure you, you might want to respond to it. He says, the biggest problem I saw with I, IPCC was how its reports were authoritative and carefully caveat, caveated, but leadership statements were often political and agenda-centered. That can toxify the science quickly in the public sphere as the form of communication more important than the form of knowledge. So it's not just social science gap, but in, inadequate articulation that the big decisions are based on values more than the data, um, and even more so facing deep uncertainty. Yeah, well, that, you know, uh, I, I'm a great admirer of Andy's work and have been following him for a long, long time. Um, and yeah, certainly true. I'm not quite sure what's meant by leadership statements were often political and agenda centered. I mean, I, th I think that is coming out more with the 1.5 degree report that came out a couple of years ago and the ways that, mm -hmm. that the, you know, messaging is being directed now, but, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the task of the IPCC, at least of working group one, is supposed to be to say, you know, here's what we know, uh, here, here's how well we know it, and leave the decisions about policy to uh, to politicians and, and publics. And, and yet, you know, I, I think part of what has happened is it's become very clear to the scientists that, that there is no progress. There's zero progress on effective policy. I mean, I didn't show this slide, but 
we have been we have had a scientific consensus on this issue for more than 40 years more than 40 years and during that time the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up every single year so on a per capita basis we're doing a little bit better but the climate doesn't care about per capita basis <laughs> at all so you know we have to get better and faster and uh, um, I think part of what's going on is that scientists are essentially doing what scientists do when they scream about the an issue that is affecting the entire world. So, you know, I, I mean, my mentor was Steve Schneider, who would always say exactly what Andy has said here. You know, the, the decisions that we have to make are based on our values. They're not based on uh, natural science. It, it can't tell us anything about what we should do. It can only tell us about what's happening. Uh, but scientists are people too, and they have values and what, and what they know is influencing what they think about what to do. So I, I, I sort of see it as a, a, a very tough position that, that scientists have been put into here where the clear message from what they are learning is that we are in a catastrophe that is accelerating instead of decelerating and that the consequences for the generation of children who are alive today, I mean, I'm teaching students who will still be alive in 2100, many of them, and they are gonna experience those consequences that seem so far off at the beginning of, uh, you know, in the 1970s when this got going. So, I don't know, I, you know, I'm kind of with the Jim Hansons of the scientific community that you got to, at a certain point, you just have to start speaking from your own values, too. Anybody uh, of the panelists wanted to um, respond? No. Okay, because the next question is for Paul as well, um, but I'll read it. Um, Paul, you, uh, this is uh, from Ryan Hagen. Uh, Paul, you mentioned whether forecasting as knowledge infrastructure. The Biden administration has announced plans to establish a national center for epidemic forecasting, described as NOAA for infectious diseases. Given your research on the establishment of climate science, what, what might we expect by way of uh, problems for the development of knowledge infrastructure in this area, and how similar or dissimilar might this project be to the areas of climate science? Okay, I, I'll speak very briefly because I don't want to take it all the time, but uh, we have some knowledge about this already because of the Google, the, the experiment that was Google flu trends. Very interesting episode, you know, so Google decided that with data, uh, search data about uh, the flu, they could track the spread of the flu faster than the CDC could do it because people, you know, when they're getting sick, they search on, you know, what symptoms, mm -hmm. flu symptoms, et cetera. So they, they did that and they did it quite successfully for a couple of years. And then in the third year of the experiment, it failed completely. And so a prize was developed by the CDC mm -hmm. to uh, for the best method to do flu forecasting. And the answer turned out to be basically weather forecasting, literally. They mm -hmm. used the same methods that weather forecasters use of taking data from doctors as it came in and adding it to a model uh, and, and, and also from the Google searcher, adding it to a model of disease spread based on causality, not on, uh, uh, on data, and it worked better. And I, I think the most amazing thing about that story is that the guy who got that prize was named Jeffrey Shaman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's actually so, the Columbia epidemiologist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the shaman found the answer. And, uh, <laughs> but, but that's that's probably what will happen in such a center. So you'll you'll be faced with a combination of forecasting methods based on models and uh, and other methods based on data and how you best combine them. So there'll be controversy about the models and also about the data. Yeah, I mean, if I can jump in on this, and this is also for Peter as well, uh, because the analogy between epidemics and climate change, I think, kind of breaks down a little bit, especially when you um, consider the temporal dynamics, the time. Yeah, um, 
we we saw for I mean one of the things I really liked in your book, Paul, was uh, the example of surface stations, which you also bring out in the article, um, in which you know um, right wing uh, right wing citizen science, but true citizen science, sort of audits climate science, and ultimately fails because ultimately in the long run they cannot demonstrate a difference. But we have been now through over the last year with a constant audit of, um, and not a very, I, I would agree with Mayanna, not, not, a, not a, you know, if you look at it carefully, not very uh, serious, but a constant audit of pandemic statistics, pandemics, information collection, all those things. And in the short temporals, which really matters in pandemic, uh, it's very destructive. Or oh, maybe not, because Peter had some, you know, some other kind of uh, um, uh, findings about, you know, what, what, when when people do do or do not trust the experts. Um, so I don't know if Peter, you wanted to discuss the the, the, the analogy or the the lack thereof between um, climate change and, and pandemics. You want me to? Sure. Anybody well, could, but yeah, please. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, very quickly. I mean, uh, yes, we haven't we haven't even done it systematically, but but what we've looked at and 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 to the extent that you know I, I've sort of started to theorize about it is you're you're perfectly right. The the, the the time scale is is very different and makes a big difference probably. Uh, but the the, uh, the the sort of speak the data on on trust uh, and we are we compare the us germany and south africa uh, and uh, we're not finished yet uh, but the, the data on trust in the experts uh, it, it is very interesting because it differs so much it even differs mm -hmm. between the us and germany i mean and as i showed the 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 uh, the this polarization you know the degree of polarization is very different uh, so there, there are so many, you know, variables that we don't understand yet. The only thing I wanted to make clear is that how apparently the the the, the degree of trust or the level of trust follows the the, the severity of the threat, uh, and uh, people are if they really fear something, then they go for the the most. What they consider the most certain, and the, and and also, by the way, a a unified answer. In other words, uh, uh, there's a lot of criticism about why did the German government the German government only rely on virologists and microbiologists and 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 a few model builders, and sort of disregarded the psychological effects, the economic effects, and so on. Well, understandably so, because uh, you know those are all dis disciplines. In that case, they don't give an answer to how do you react, you know, tomorrow or next week. And in fact, we are now—I uh, don't know if you know about that—but I mean, we are now. Although we did a fairly good show in the beginning, but we now have a huge problem, uh, and and may end up with you know some of the worst uh, results. And of course, now the, the experts are openly criticizing the politicians. They said that that was not the case until very recently. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question and it actually dovetails beautifully with what you were saying, Peter, but I think it's directed at Mayana. This is a, a, a question uh, from Alex uh, de Shabinin. Uh, climate scientists typically have very well-defined problem sets and models and often are more coordinated in their support of science agendas. I sense that social science agendas are much more diverse, meaning the ability to lobby for funding is potentially more challenging owing to a lack of certain, a lack of unanimity. This is relevant at, uh, as Colombia is establishing a new climate school, but it has broader implications. Do Mayana or other panelists have thoughts on how to increase the importance of the social science research agenda? I would say, given the fact that we social scientists don't tend to agree on anything. <laughs> yes, that's a definite uh, problem. I mean, 
I think that social scientists need some time. I think uh, natural scientists have had a long time to do this. And, I'm, and I know that there's an urgency in terms of action, but I think this is a very good question. And I think that the social sciences are, or, and scientists are you know, not the answer for everything. I mean, there are some real problems of how we operate. We love to disagree amongst the, ourselves more than agree. You know, so I think it would take some work, but it would have to take some leadership so that you try to cut through that and not let everyone, you know, try to be the holier than thou, I have the more radical perspective, you know, but then we try to think, what are the goals? What is really at stake? And what are the goals? What can we agree on? You know, and also within the social sciences get outside. I mean, there's such a tendency right now to also valorize more the quantitative. So, you know, what social sciences, you know, get to be included? How can we include also the humanities? I mean, get these questions of values and what truly motivates people into the, the discussion. So it'll be very, very crucial who's in charge of that, in, that, that process. But I think it will need some pre, you know, really careful thinking and, and some, some wise people for that to work out. Okay, um, we are out of time. I really would like to thank our panelists, Mayana and Peter and Paul, uh, for this really stimulating conversation. I also would like to thank Aaron and Musa, Musa for uh, steering the pot and, and pushing us along into this conversation. Let me give a shout out for Michael Falco and Julius Wilson who are in the background, you know, well, keeping everything working. Um, and um, to our audience uh, who has, you know, Build up the chat and the Q&A with, with lots of questions. I urge you to, you know, to look at it when you can. Um, and there's a thanks from the audience as well. So um, hopefully you can all join us on May 17th as well when we have Naomi um, and, and Mike Holm and, and um, Andy um, in a discussion that I think will dovetail on this and we'll continue this. Can you, Thank you. Can you send us or send me an invitation anyway? We will, yes. Uh, Nice. This was a great discussion, and I really wish we could have gone on a lot longer. <laughs> yes. Just getting going here. Well, well, we could we could uh, you know meet separately, uh, <laughs> but Zoom makes it possible. <laughs> uh, Andy has a great uh, format, also. Um, uh, I think it's called S Sustain What. Um, uh, with um, uh, weekly conversations and people have, I think uh, the audience has a much more free way of, of uh, talking with, um, and just to give a shout out to Andy is gonna have Naomi Areskes tomorrow at his uh, Sustain Watt um, uh, podcast. Cool. Yeah. Great. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, thank you, uh, especially the Europeans who are also, uh, the time is, is late there. Uh, the Californians who had to uh, wake up early. Um, yeah. Just getting